Good morning, everybody. It's good to be with you here this morning. I was just thinking about what Joel shared. Well, there's a lot of things that Joel shared. But I don't want you to be afraid if I ever ask you for coffee, all right? All right, so this morning we're going to continue in uh, talking in, uh, from Sermon on the Mount, and uh, we're going to look again at a part which specifically talks about prayer, and we, uh, we've decided we're going to break this up uh, into two parts rather than try and do everything in one. So uh, we'll talk this week, and then we will talk next week as well about prayer. Uh, so the reading this morning is going to be a little bit disjointed. We will read uh, from... In, in Matthew 6, we'll read from verse 5, and we'll stop at verse 9, and then we'll read again 14 and 15. Um, and then we might get to 16 to 18, which talks about fasting, um, but we'll see. So, if you'll turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6, and we're going to look uh, from verse 5, we'll read from verse 5. I'm not sure what page number that is, I probably should have that. 811, there it is, right there on the screen. All right, here we go. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. And then we'll skip from 9 through 15, and we'll go to 16. And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. As John pointed out last week, when Jesus was starting to teach uh, in this particular section, obviously there wasn't a section at that time, but when Jesus was starting to teach in, in this particular section that we have, uh, he was addressing three things uh, within Jewish faith or within the duties of being a good Jew. And the first thing he was addressing was giving to the poor, and the second thing was prayer, and then the third thing was fasting, all of which were required uh, in order for you to be a good Jewish person or a good Jewish believer. And uh, Jesus is then addressing these things because he's making right those practices that people had put in place that was really more all about them than it was actually about what they were supposed to be doing in honoring God. Because this whole piece that Jesus is talking about, as we've been saying over the course of the past about eight weeks now, is that it's not actually about us as much as it is about the God who is in us. Because if it's all about us, then what Jesus is teaching here is just a set of different rules or a set of different instructions for us, that if we just check off all of these different things, then we've got it right, and we can just go on with our day. And it makes it easy for us, all right? We just follow, just follow the pattern, all right? Here's the pattern, just follow the pattern, and just do what it is that you're told to do. It's kind of like obedience because of the law. But what Jesus is actually challenging us on here is not obedience because of the law or obedience because of rules or practice or even obedience because this is your habit of doing things. Because we know how easy it is for our habit of doing things to actually lose the reason why we are actually practicing the habit. So instead of this being a set of rules or practices, just do these things to make yourself feel like you're right with God, or at least appease God to keep Him happy, because, you know, you've got to keep God happy, because if you don't keep Him happy, you don't get all the good things that you want from Him, right? I know none of you ever think like that. 
But the point being that if this is just about doing those things, then we've lost the fact that we're actually supposed to be magnifying God within our lives. That He is actually the one that in the things that we're doing, that He actually would receive the glory because of the things that we're doing. That has got very little to do with us, and therefore the things that we do, we don't do by the law, we don't do by the rules, or we don't do because it's our habit. We do those things because it's by faith in the God who has called us to Himself. That's the whole point of what Jesus is teaching. Well, that's the whole point. There's a lot of things that He's teaching, but that's kind of the gist of what He's saying in, in all of His teaching in the Sermon on the Mount. All right, if you can just do these things, if you're not, if you're not angry with somebody in your heart, uh, then, then you're not going to murder them. If you don't have lust in your heart, then you're not going to commit adultery. If you don't have unforgiveness in your heart, then God is going to forgive you. If you don't judge people, then God... It's not a, a, an if and then type of situation, all right? Because it's what God has called us to in who He is and what He has placed inside of us in terms of the Holy Spirit that enables us to be able to do the things which is just a natural expression of who God is. So that means that in whatever circumstance you find yourself in or whatever situation, whether it's a good circumstance or a bad one, whether it's just the run-of-the-mill mundane work circumstance or you're at home and you're just kind of doing whatever it is that you do at home every single day as you wake up and have breakfast and things, that in all of those things that God is a part of that and that He receives glory because you are doing that because He's there with you. And so when Jesus starts teaching here on prayer, He's really confronting many of the practices that people were doing that made them good Jews. He's not saying that these people weren't good Jews by the way that they were practicing those things. He's not coming down, He's not trying to say to them, hey, you know what, you guys need to just stop praying. He's not saying that. He's not saying don't go to the synagogue or don't go to the temple. Or, don't do. He's not saying that. He's just saying, why are you going to do those things? Because if you're going to do those things because it's all about the other people in the room or the other people outside who are seeing you, if it's all about that, then great, you're rewarded because they'll come and they'll, they'll pat you on the back and you'll feel good about yourself and maybe you'll feel built up or edified in some way because they will recognize you to be a holy person or a righteous person or a, or a good person or whatever it is. And, and so they'll come and they'll encourage you and say, good job. And God will say, there's your reward, which is the reward we want, right? We want the praises of men, right? No, but yes, we do. If we're honest, we want people to see us in a certain way. We want people to imagine that we are a certain kind of certain practices that we do or that we, you know, are perhaps a little better than the guy that doesn't go to church. We want people to see that in us and then maybe trust us. And we want a good testimony in the community that we're a part of. Yes, we do. But we want a good testimony in the community that we are part of so that they will see God, not us. And that's what Jesus is getting at here. This is not about people seeing you. This is about people seeing your Father. And if we can get that sorted out in our hearts, then doing those things that He calls us to do will be a challenge for us in our flesh, but when we yield our flesh and we surrender it to Him, it will be a joy to us in the midst of all of the different circumstances that we might find ourselves in, which, by the way, as He's alluded to before, not He didn't allude to it, He just said it, which will involve persecution. In the midst of that, you can still glorify the Father. So, he first addresses, don't be like the hypocrites, then he goes to, don't be like the Gentiles, and then he teaches, well, be like this, actually. 
you're not going to be like the Gentiles, if you're not going to be like the hypocrites, then this is how you need to be. Well, how do you not want to be like the Gentiles? Well, the example that you can have, probably the clearest example that you can have from Scripture of the Gentiles praying is when um, Elijah uh, meets with the prophets of Baal on the mountaintop, right? And you've got these guys who are busy whipping themselves until they bleed, and they're ranting and they're raving and they're calling on Baal. And they're calling on him to try to come and pour down fire and consume the sacrifice. And they go on and on and on. And, and Elijah says to them, well, maybe you need to shout a little louder because he can't hear you. Or maybe he is relieving himself. Or maybe he's asleep. Or maybe this God of yours has gone on a journey. And they whip themselves up into a frenzy, hoping that by the many things that they say and the insistent begging and pleading, that they will somehow persuade the God that they are worshiping to answer them, to prove that He's even a God. You see, because the Gentiles' view, and in terms of uh, the Jews, the Gentile was anybody who wasn't a Jew, but in terms of the Gentiles, the Romans, the Greeks, the gods weren't nice people, all right? There's, there's not very many gods that were considered, considered within pagan world to be benevolent or kind or generous. In, in fact, they were pretty, they were pretty uh, angry, mean, and vengeful lot, and they generally the view was that the gods used people to play this kind of cosmic game, and so they would just move people to these different places and have these different events come. And so that would happen in people's lives. And so in order to, to stave off all the bad things, the famine and the drought and the invasions and the destruction of foreign armies and all of those other things, in order to stave those things off and to just keep them at bay, you had to keep the gods happy so that those things wouldn't, happy to, wouldn't happen to you. So your sacrifice had to be just correct. Your worship had to be just adoring enough, which is why when we look at it and we say, what would possess a person to possibly take their child and offer their child on a as a sacrifice to a foreign god? Which in our minds would be, who would do that? Well, a person would do that if they believed that that which was coming to them was going to be so calamitous and so disastrous that they needed to somehow appease that God who was coming to take vengeance upon them. And Jesus says, don't be like that. Don't be like them repeatedly trying to insist and beg and plead and cajole and somehow kind of twist God's arm to do the things that you want Him to do in your life because you're afraid of Him because you're afraid that somehow He's not going to do quite the right thing that you need, and therefore you need to somehow persuade Him that you're better than maybe what He thinks that you are, or that maybe you're deserving better than what other people might suggest that you deserve. And so if we can possibly appease Him with, with all of our words and all of our sayings and all of our rote kind of babble that goes on sometimes in, in the way that people speak, that somehow God will be happy with that. And Jesus says, that's not your father. But at the same time, He says to them, but don't be like the hypocrites, which He then likens to the religious authorities and the, the very religious people. I'm not saying that religion and being religious is a bad thing. I'm just saying like I said earlier, it, it just can't be about you. So if you fast regularly and you pray regularly and you read your Bible regularly, well, you would be considered religious. Now, I know we like to say, well, no, we're not religious. We have a relationship. Yes, you do. I understand that. But in your religious practice, it's because you have the relationship that you practice those things. It's not like a free-for-all. Sometimes we treat God like, well, I have a relationship with Him, so He's going to hang around, He's my buddy, He's going to hang around, and He'll show up when He needs to show up, and I'll show up when I feel like showing up, and, you know, but, but God is so gracious, and He just kind of, He just understands. He's just so forgiving that He'll just forgive, and I can just kind of do whatever it is that I want, and, and you're deceived. 
to believe that that's true. Because as much as what God is your father, he's not your buddy. Sorry to shatter that illusion. But at the same time, Jesus says, don't be like the hypocrites who treat him like he's in a special place on a special altar and that's all the place that he is in. And that somehow when you put on your mask and you live like this in one particular place and then you come into the temple, you come into the sanctuary and you act differently than what you just did five minutes ago when you were in the car. Not that they had cars, but you get the point. So when you act five differently from what you did five minutes ago in the car and you walk into the sanctuary and you put on the mask, which is what the hypocrite did, because the hypocrite was the orator and the actor in the Greek play, and they would wear different masks to assume different roles, and their purpose was to try and persuade people that that which the people were seeing was actually true of them, you know, because you're watching a play, so you want to be convincing, but actually in the persuading of the people, you're actually trying to deceive them to believe that which they see is true as opposed to that which they don't see being true. And Jesus says, no, we're not called to be like the hypocrites. We're not called to act in such a way that we parade ourselves before men and put on a show for people in order to think, for them to think that we are holy. Because God knows who we are and He knows how we are and He searches our hearts and He sees us. And really what He wants from us is the honest acknowledgement that He is God and we are not and yet He's enabled us to come into relationship with Him in such a way that we're able to call Him Dad or father, or daddy, or whatever other affectionate word that you have for your dad. And so then Jesus starts to teach here, once he's eliminated the, don't be like the Gentiles, madly babbling and raving on and on, don't be like the hypocrites putting on the air of grace and show and all of the religious practices that people expect you to have, because after all, you're a good Jew in this case, that's who he was talking to, don't put on those things because in that case you get your reward from men. He says, no. He says, but when you... And, and remember then, he doesn't say, but if. There is no if here. There is no if you pray. Jesus assumes that if you are in relationship with the Father, that you will pray. Which is why he doesn't give you a, okay, well, when you come at this time or at this time or, or when you're in this place or, no, it's just, but when? It's, it's an open-ended time where you may be in one particular location or another, in one special place or in a not-so-special place, in the midst of incredible trial, in the midst of great difficulty, at the heights of pure joy, but when you are there, come to the Father. And he describes a place there that here he says you go into, let me read it to you, and he says they go into your room and shut the door. What was he referencing there? Well, I mean, you could possibly, there's nothing wrong with having a room where you go to to pray. There's nothing wrong with having a specific place where you go to to pray. That's not what he's trying to, he's not trying to say you have to have a special room. It's not like, well, sorry kids, the five of you are going to be in one bedroom now because I need a special room to pray. That's not what he's talking about. But if you have a place and it is a room, go into the room and shut the door. Quite literally, <laughs> close the door. Why? Because it's private. But if you don't have a room, then have a place. 
a place where you set yourself apart and you're making that time available for yourself to connect with God. Now, that sounds awfully religious, but you know what? It's better for that time to be the time where you are consciously connecting with God than for you to go on about your day and then suddenly some disaster happens, say, oh, Jesus, I need you, and then you carry on and not have any time where you've actually set time aside to be with the Lord. And I get it. Sure, God is with us all the time, everywhere that we go, and we can be constantly, we are constantly in His presence. And I, 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 yes, I understand those things. But Jesus is also saying, you know what? Carve out some time, guys. Carve out some time in the midst of your schedule when it happens to work for you, I don't know when that time is. He doesn't say go into your room at midday. He doesn't say go into your room at 5 a.m. in the morning or go into your room at 10 p.m. at night. He just says go into your room. Find the place where you separate yourself from all of the distractions and go into that place and meet with the Father. The inner room in the house, typically, in the time that this has been written, in biblical times, the inner room was used typically for two things in the house. It was either a storage room where the supplies or the food were kept, or it was a place where you kept your treasure. Both of those work if you want to think about what it is that you're actually receiving from God when you enter into that inner room, when you enter into the presence of the Lord. When you set that time aside and say, Lord, I need you here in my life, not because there's a crisis, not because I've got a busy day, not because, just because I need you, and I know that I am unable to continue in this life, this day, at this time, if I don't meet with you. And whether it's out of the stores that He supplies for you in the inner room, or whether it's out of the treasure that He has hidden for you in the inner room, it doesn't matter which one at which particular time it is. The fact of the matter is, is that it's from God meeting you in that place that you receive that which you need in order for you to be strengthened and encouraged and to go on with your life. And it says, I discovered in reading this passage, I discovered why our prayer meetings are so poorly attended because it's a secret place, right? And none of you want to come to public prayer, right? You should think about that. Hmm, it's a little uncomfortable. You want me to go on? You see, what Jesus says is when we come into prayer, and again, this can be this can be challenging for us because so many of the things that we relate in terms of relating to God relates to the earthly life that we're living. But he distinctly says that you come to your Father. I can remember for myself that the greatest time that I could spend was with my Father my earthly father. It's not like he was a phenomenal man without mistakes, without blemishes, without sin. But I knew that if I had time with him, that I would have peace. I can remember we would drive from our house and particularly because I was just heavily involved in sport, and sometimes we would be playing, we'd be playing sports matches, rugby matches, and it would be 45 minutes to an hour away. And the best time, I didn't need to go with my teammates, I didn't need to go with the bus, not that there were buses in those days that would do that, but nevertheless, all I needed to do was to get in the car, and it was given that my dad would drive me there. And he didn't have to say anything on that journey. He just had to drive the car. He just had to be there. It was just in his presence as a young man 
that I could just sit and just, he was there. Now I say that what I started off with is, well, sometimes you may not have had that experience with your dad. But it didn't change the fact that you had a longing in your heart for the Father. Because you see, that longing that you might have had to be in the presence of your dad, irrespective of who he might have been, and irrespective of how he might have acted towards you or treated you, that the longing that you had inside was because it was God that you were longing for and God wanted to meet with you. And now, what's one of my greatest joys? Waiting for the kids to come home. Not because I have great pearls of wisdom, not because I have great stories or great things that I need to tell them, just because they're home. Why? Because the Father longs to be with His children. And so it's no different for us when we engage in a relationship with our Heavenly Father. Irrespective of how your earthly father might have been with all of his flaws and all of his sins and all of the things that he might have done. It's your heavenly Father who has placed within you the desire for you to connect with Him in such a way that you will not be satisfied outside of that connection, no matter how good your earthly father actually was. And Jesus presumes that we want to meet with Him because God has placed that in our hearts to desire to be with Him. And then He says to us, in so doing, in meeting with your Father, in so doing, there's a place where you have to absolutely trust Him, which is why you don't need to go on babbling and carrying on and begging and pleading with Him. You have to absolutely trust Him that your heavenly Father, who is perfectly good and perfectly knows, as Jesus says, exactly what you need. That in the perfection of who God is, that you are then able to trust Him and surrender your will to His will to allow Him to do in your life which He desires to do. Because if we're honest, there's many things in our lives which God probably desires to do, but we don't desire them because they're just plain uncomfortable, because it's difficult, because it's challenges that we don't want to have to face and decisions that we don't want to have to take because of all of the ramifications of those decisions, because all of those choices that we make, what do you mean we have to cho choose between this relationship with this person as opposed to surrendering it to God? You mean I have to trust God in the midst of Him meeting, in the midst of the, the circumstances of my business or the circumstances of my employment and the fact that God will absolutely supply all that I need? Really? That He actually does know better than you know? We can't trust ourselves. Now, I know that that may sound a little harsh, but you know what? The Bible tells us our hearts are deceptive. We deceive ourselves into what we think we need sometimes. And that's not to say that there aren't good things that God wants to give you. I mean, it does say that He's going to reward you. When you withdraw into His presence, that you will be rewarded. And we've misused that to some degree. Sure, it could mean that God supplies your need in whatever it is. It might be that He supplies your need in finances or in some kind of provision or some kind of 
of um, success in your job or that He might provide peace in your family and he, He might provide those things for you because it might be that He wants to reward you with those things. But what if the reward is to persevere? What if the reward is to endure through pain? What if the reward is to be determined to not give up despite circumstances being overwhelmingly against you? What if that's the reward? What if the reward is an increased faith, an increased trust, an increased belief? What if that's the reward? And that only comes through the persecution or through the struggle or through the trial or through the temptation or through the sickness or through the loss or through the death. What if persevering in that place when you have withdrawn to be with the Father and He says, just a little while longer, stay in the fight. Stay the course, run the race, finish. What if that's the reward? And yet we live in this world, on this earth, in these circumstances, and all we can see is the things that are in front of our faces and the, the, what people are telling us from all the different sides that we hear or whoever it is that we happen to listen to and give ear to their reports. And we get so caught up in all of the circumstances of this life and I need to have this and I need to go there and I need to do this and I need to finish here and I, I need to get qualified and I need a better degree and I need more jo- money so I need a better job so I need to live in a bigger house so I can live in a different city so I can... And it's all here. And we carry on praying like the Gentiles do, somehow believing that if we can just prove how good we are, that God will give us all those things. And he's saying, come into the place of your great trial and allow me to reward you as you draw close to me. As you abide in my presence. Let me reward you in that place. Let me fill you with myself in that place in the midst of desperate circumstances. Things that have been done wrong to you. Circumstances that by all rights should not happen or have happened to you in your life. And God says, yes, but I know. Draw close to me. Come and abide in my presence. We, we love Psalm 91, right? Psalm 91 is a great psalm. But I want you to hear what the psalmist writes. Not the part about deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence and he will cover you. Just hear what he's saying. Where will you be covered? Where will you be delivered? Where will God show His faithfulness to you? Psalm 91. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. And God responds in verse 14, and it says, Because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. When he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. It's not outside of the refuge. It's not outside of the fortress. It's not outside of the trouble. It's in the midst of the trouble. 
And God says, come. Come to me and trust me with every circumstance that you find in your life. The good ones and the bad ones. The easy ones for you and the difficult ones. But come and know that I am good and that I long for you to not only to be in my presence, but for me to be in your presence, to acknowledge you in a way and for you to acknowledge me in a way that doesn't just give me lip service, that doesn't just ask me what it is that you could possibly get from me. Because if we're honest, we don't ask for those things that we don't want. And yet God says, surrender your heart. In the inner room, wherever that is, however that looks, surrender your heart and allow me to do those things in your life that will be a reward because how you're doing this is by faith and trust in the God who has given himself so fully to you that he took his one and only son and sacrificed him on a cross so that we might know him. There is nothing more that he could do to make it possible for us to be in relationship with him. Absolutely nothing more. He did everything that he knew that we needed. And he left the trials and he left the temptations and he left the difficulties and he left the troubles and he left the challenges so that you would know that he is good because he will give you that which you need in the midst of all of those things. But come. Don't keep me far off. Don't stand aloof from me. Come. And let's commune. Let's abide. Let's dwell together. Find the inner room. Find the secret place where you meet with your Father and allow Him to meet with you. Let's pray. Father, we trust you to do a work in each of our hearts that would result in us abiding or dwelling or being sheltered in your presence constantly in the day. We know that this cannot be a work of our flesh. We know that we can't manufacture this in ourselves, but that you require us to come because we trust you and we surrender our hearts to you. And so we ask you to do that impossible work in our hearts that would turn our hearts towards you, that would long to be in your presence more than we long for anything else that this world gives us. Father, we love you. We thank you for the work that you have done to make this possible through the sacrifice of your son, Jesus, on the cross. We worship you, Lord. Do your work in us. Draw us to yourself. In Jesus' name.